Our gospel reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 15, verses 10 through 28. If you'd like to follow along in your pew Bible, you can find it on page 17 of the New Testament, or as always, you can listen. Then he, meaning Jesus, called the crowd to him and said to them, listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. And he said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that what goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The word of the Lord. So I don't think it's a mistake that lectionary writers place this week's gospel reading about the Canaanite woman's great faith against the backdrop of last week's reading from the same gospel about Peter's little faith. It seems at least on the surface as though these lectionary writers want us to compare the faith of the two. Faith, it's a hard subject. A disciple, an insider, a student of the master, a friend and confidant, has little. While an outsider, a Canaanite, a woman, a Jesus-proclaimed dog, has great faith. Who says that the Bible isn't full of surprises? Author and preaching professor Caroline Lewis says that faith is one of those words that makes her nervous when it comes to preaching. It even made her top 10 list of words to warn her students about using in a sermon. For the most part, I am in agreement with her, mostly because faith is just so difficult to define. And we throw the word faith around as if we all had some agreed upon definition. But I would be willing to bet that if we took a poll right here, right now, in this place, we would discover that we don't have an agreed upon definition 
at all. I mean, is faith something we do? Is it something we demonstrate? Is it something that we just have? Is it gifted to us? Do we possess it or does it possess us? How do we know if we have it? Can other people tell? And are we born with it? Can we grow it? Can we lose it? Does it die? It's not that easy, is it? Faith just seems like it's one of those fallback words that Christians use in order to gain an audience. Even if, or maybe especially if, we don't know what else to say. It seems like it's one of those code words for getting in and staying in this secret Jesus club. If we use it right, we get to be here. And we talk about faith in really interesting ways, like if we have a lot of it, if we have enough of it, that everything will work out in our lives the way that we want it to. We say things to each other like, have a little faith. Pray and have faith that things will work out. Have faith in God. Clearly, we think that faith does something for us. But what? I mean, can someone tell me how to do it? How to use it? Can I regulate the amount of faith I have at any given moment? Like some toggle switch? And I'm sorry, but I'm not buying it. Sometimes faith does not give us what we want. There are times in my life where I have felt like I was full of great faith and nothing worked out the way that I thought it should. And there have been other times in my life where I felt like faith was so far away from me, where it had deserted me, and yet things did work out. And each time there was someone in my life pointing, saying, that's because you had faith. But I can tell you right now, it sure didn't feel like faith when it happened. So while I generally agree with Caroline Lewis that faith is one of those words we should think twice about before we use in a sermon, I also think that when we do choose to use it, or when we really need to use it, because our lectionary reading depends upon how we define that term, that we take the time to be honest about it. That we quit throwing it around as if it's self-explanatory and we all agree upon its definition, but instead talk about what it means how we feel about it, what we think about it. After all, we are a church, we are a community of faith, and if we can't talk about what that means here in this place, then we can't talk about it anywhere. So this story of the Canaanite woman's great faith appears at an interesting place in the Gospel of Matthew. It appears right after Jesus finishes critiquing some of the customs that the religious leaders have of declaring who is and who isn't defiled, who is and who isn't clean. And Jesus critiques these religious leaders by pointing out that ritual purification benefits no one. No one, that is, except maybe these religious leaders. Jesus also points out that their actions and words concerning ritual purification not only exclude others, but are harmful to others and harmful to them and harmful to their entire community. So immediately after that discussion, we have this story about the Canaanite woman's great faith. And I'll be honest with you, this story has always bothered me because 
I don't know what it is that makes her faith great in this story. Is it because she has the guts to call Jesus out for being a real class A jerk? I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. I mean, she has the courage to stand up and confront the very person, the only person she thinks can change her and her daughter's life, and she does so without fear, something Peter had trouble getting rid of last week. Now, most of us would be groveling, requesting a proper introduction from Jesus' friends, minding our P's and Q's, saying, please, sir, and no, sir, and yes, sir, and thank you, with our proper southern charm. So is the fact that she does none of this, but instead matches him comment for comment, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs from their master's table. Is that what makes her faith great? Or is it because she's able to recognize who Jesus is, calling him both Lord and Son of David, something Jesus' own disciples in the Gospel of Matthew have struggled with up until this point? Or is what makes her faith great, the fact that she knows what she needs and claims her right to have it. Is it that simple? Or is it great because she has invested all of her hope in the idea that Jesus can heal her daughter? Or is it great because she transgresses all of the boundaries imposed upon her by her culture and by the disciples and by Jesus' own definitions of race and geography and worthiness in order to pursue healing, not for herself, but for someone that she loves? Or is her faith great because she refuses to go away? She refuses to be ignored. She refuses to be invisible. She persists. Or is her faith great? Because she recognizes, I can't do this alone. And she asks for help. I honestly don't know what makes her faith great in this story. But I have a feeling that if I did know with certainty, if we did know with certainty that we would all be doing more of whatever it was that she was doing or praying to have more of whatever it is that she had because great faith is surely better than just a little, right? Now, I don't know if any of you notice that there's a demon in this story. This story has a demon in it. And this demon threatens to place a permanent boundary between this woman, her daughter, and everyone else that they encounter. This demon threatens to isolate them, threatens to categorize them and name them and dismiss them as being unworthy. Unworthy of being called human. Unworthy of God's love and grace and healing. Unworthy of being treated with dignity and respect. And much like the people that the religious leaders condemned as being unclean, unworthy of having civil discourse with, or even human contact. But the sad thing is that this demon, it doesn't just threaten this woman and her daughter. It threatens many more people than that. See, if it can separate this family 
this woman and her daughter from everyone else, then it has an opening. It has an invitation given by the rest of us to separate just about anyone from just about anything it wants to. And this demon, it is so persuasive. It is so cunning. It is so ingrained in our culture and in our everyday lives. It is so difficult to recognize, so easy to ignore, so easy to dismiss. So much a part of our lives that it almost goes unnoticed. This demon almost fools even Jesus himself. That is until this Canaanite woman, this outsider, appears before Jesus shouting at him, shouting in order to reveal to Jesus that he too is susceptible to the demon's charm. He is human after all. That is what being incarnate means. He too is tempted to just turn his back. He too is tempted to refuse to participate in something he did not start and something that most would consider to be none of his business. He too is tempted to renounce his trust that God is redeeming the world. He too is tempted to let injustice and untrue assumptions about what it is that defiles a person or a people rage down through the streets while he chooses to protect only what is his own. There's a demon in this story. And make no mistake, it is a very powerful demon. It threatens to destroy every character. It threatens to destroy our faith in humanity. Faith. There's that word again. The more I think about it, perhaps the lectionary writers did not include the stories of Peter's little faith and the Canaanite woman's great faith in subsequent weeks so that we would compare the two, judging whose is best. Perhaps their intent was instead to show the full width and breadth and complexity of what a life of faith really looks like. That faith does not amount to just a one-time proclamation, I believe in Jesus Christ, as if it were a magic set of words, good for all times and all places, and the only thing we have to do in all circumstances. Rather, a life of faith is full of ups and downs. It's full of times where you may feel afraid that you're going to drown and other times when you're on top of a mountain, elated. It's full of times when we desperately struggle to grasp on to something and other times when we're just comfortable being at peace. It's full of times when there's just naive certainty and crushing doubt. Perhaps a life of faith is less about knowing and proclaiming and more about the kind of urgent living that Peter was demonstrating when he stepped out of that boat and onto the water. Or the kind of urgent living that this Canaanite woman was demonstrating when she shouted at Jesus to pay attention it's the kind of living that requires us, requires us to pay attention right now 
to how God is calling us to be and to do, to pay attention right now to the vast amount of people that God's love is extended to, to pay attention right now to what we can do, not only to extend ourselves, but to extend God's love to those who need it most. Lord, have mercy on us. Amen.